How many of you would like to be with a personality clone of yourself? <laughs> two people. Well, two or three. Two or three. three people. We'd like to interview you after today. <laughs> I, I love this cartoon. I saw one time, and, and a person says to their friend, don't you think that my narcissism is the most interesting feature about me? <laughs> so if you don't have a strong desire to be with a personality clone of yourself, now you have to deal with differences. May we <clears throat> introduce the concept of differentiation. Differentiation. And when I am introducing the concept of differentiation to my clients, the easiest way for me to do that is to show them a disco ball. Um, we show, just happen to carry uh, these around whenever we do therapy. <laughs> Well, I have a little one like this in my <laughs> office, and the, on this disco ball, all these different mirrors represent facets of ourselves. And as we get to know our partners better and better, if the relationship is going well, you're able to expose more parts of yourself, and it doesn't create conflict. <clears throat> However, for most couples, as they begin to define themselves more actively, as they begin to share more thoughts, more feelings, more wishes and desires, they inevitably bump into those areas of difference. When, when empathy is gone, <clears throat> humanity, our core, is gone. We are now into a transactional world. We're now into a utilitarian world where we transact to get our needs met, we transact to our advantage, which is based upon our self-absorption and our belief that other people want what I want, and if they don't, they're simply in the wrong place. Uh, losing empathy, other people become, become objects. Now, when you become an object to me, you're no longer a person. This is the tragedy. I can then treat you any way I need to treat you to get you to respond to my self-absorbed needs. I can yell at you. I can scream at you. I can ignore you. I can kill you. I can deprive you. You're not a person. <clears throat> and my experience, most couples, when they come to see me, the ones who need to be there, not the ones I can educate and send on their way, most couples have an objectified relationship. So if you really understand the fantasy, you are often getting at a person's truth at a level of bareness that you can hardly get at in any other way. Because in our fantasies, we will pour our deepest wishes, our more persistent needs, our quests from omnipotence, our fears of desertion, everything. Our deepest psychology will be metaphorically transposed into our fantasies, but with an outcome that is always bound to give us pleasure. Nobody suffers in a fantasy. Even if the plot is one that inflicts suffering, the goal is always pleasure. Do you understand? If you don't make the connection immediately, you just look at little kids who play. And in general, we tend to play with something that isn't part of our condition. Meaning, if you are in jail, you rarely want to play prisoner. If you understand. In order to play with something, you must have just enough distance that allows you to take back the original plot and turn it into a source of excitation and pleasure by virtue of your being the director, the author, and the protagonist all at once. So you create all pieces. Like in a dream, it's a psychic structure. And like in a dream, working with fantasy is about decoding that symbolic structure. So, otherness initially is terrifying. And it's terrifying because, let me say this again, 
when you accept otherness, the otherness of another who is your partner, you no longer have any power to control them. You have given them to themselves, and they belong to their experience, and you are no longer the regulator of their emotions, their thinking, their interiority, or their behavior. And to simply surrender that is an amazing spiritual experience. You know, spiritual, all the spiritualities talk about surrender. And I think this is probably the most terrifying surrender of all. Because when you surrender control, you then also have to surrender the predictability you have that you will not be controlled. That is, you are now put yourself into vulnerability. So we really encourage couples to be sure this is a mutual surrender, that they both uh, go to the altar and lay their sins upon the altar together so that this is a mutual surrender of control. What I want to do is to talk with you about the basic stuff of doing couples interviews that we don't learn in graduate school. I mean, one version of this uh, presentation is uh, what they didn't teach you in graduate school. Um, and what we tend to learn are models and theories, um, but how to actually get through a session with a couple. And I, um, it, 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 I, I wrote about this once, uh, about the, uh, uh, that if there's a contest for the worst experience in a first session of couples therapy, in a career, like the first time, I, I have one that I like to enter. The very first time I ever saw a couple, it was about 15 minutes in, they were meandering around, I was meandering with them, and the husband, it was a husband and wife pair, the husband said to me, I don't think you know what you're doing. <laughs> that was the most perceptive comment anyone made in the entire session. Uh, about 10 minutes later, my right eye started to twitch. <laughs> so I've lived, I've lived to tell about it. Um, and, uh, and, and as I have done this work and taught and supervised, I've been more and more struck by how we don't talk about the basics. It's like we're training surgeons, but we don't talk about creating a sterile field and where you do the incision and how you get to the organ, how you, how you tie people up. And a lot of the mistakes, a lot of, of bad outcomes in couples therapy happens in the first session. I grew up in a community that was all Holocaust survivors. So was my family. And in my community, there were two groups of people. Those who didn't die and those who came back to life. You can apply this to trauma all the time. You can also apply this to couples. Those who didn't die were people who lived rather teetered to the ground, very afraid, no willingness to leap out into the world anymore because too fearful of the consequences, um, in a state of vigilance, and neither could they experience pleasure nor their children. Because to experience pleasure, you have to have a minimum of unselfconsciousness and carefreeness any vigilance, any fear, any anxiety precludes pleasure, and that is a golden rule for sexuality. But the people who came back to life were the people who kind of had understood how to keep themselves alive, how to understand the erotic as a force to beat back deadness, which is what I think many couples come to us for. Many of them, when they complain about the listlessness of their sex lives, they don't just want more sex, they want better sex. And the better that they're talking about is to reconnect with the quality of aliveness and vibrancy and renewal and playfulness that sex wants to afford them or that they think maybe one day they could find there. People come with a yearning to feel alive. People will often act with exuberant defiance as in all the range of infidelities to beat back the deadness. And that's where the connection and the erotic intimacy brings the space where this could all be experienced. Now we posit that human suffering 
has its roots in ruptured connection in childhood. <clears throat> and the people who have studied childhood assume that those connectional ruptures begin very early, perhaps even with the first transaction with the infant, and uh, up until, and with, with the very difficult transactions, to the end of the first year of life. And then there are patterns that have been set in with the baby, in which whatever was ruptured, how, whatever the rupture was, becomes a pattern of rupture, and the child experiences anxiety. Now, I want to put underneath the word anxiety that my view that anxiety is the beginning also of desire, that those are two sides of the coin. Whatever one, whatever triggers one's anxiety, that is the rupture of connection, also triggers desire. Desire is born there, um, and when desire is born and anxiety is there, there's a loss of a sense of otherness in the, in the, uh, the self-absorption. There is a loss of the awareness of uh, the internal world of others. Uh, I become, I am one, um, we are one and I am the one, the loss of empathy um, and the objectification of others. And that objectification we think is the origin of conflict. Okay. So the question really was what, what predicts divorce and stability? How are the masters and the disasters different? And one thing we discover is that if you just take the amount of positive emotion in a conflict discussion and divide it by the amount of negative emotion, so positive emotion is uh, things like interest in one another, asking questions, humor, affection, empathy, uh, validation, understanding, and negative emotions, hostility, anger, uh, disappointment, hurt feelings, uh, tension, and so on, contempt. And we find that in relationships that are stable, the ratio of positive to negative is about five. Five times as many positive things during conflict as negative things. Whereas for couples that are heading for divorce or continued misery, the ratio of positive to negative is about 0.8. So just a little bit more negative than positive. And the apartment lab, that ratio went to 20 to 1. So a relationship has got to be a rich climate of positive compared to negative emotion, even during conflict. And, uh, and just the opposite of what George Bach suggested, really the masters of relationships were really nice to each other. They were gentle. They thought about how to say things. They minimized defensiveness. And research, which likes to become scientific um, and has, be has kind of become very popular at this moment and, um, and we like the concept of evidence-based, but so much of what happens between two people that is important is what is not visible. And how do we research that? So we do, I read all the research too, but when I sit in the room, I am really not thinking about research at all. I am thinking about two individuals. Let's talk about the crisis you asked before. Um, you know, the crisis of an affair is not a static thing. It is not the same on the night after as it is on the side of the... P There's multiple crises. The crisis of the person who is wondering how they're going to end the affair or the crisis of the person who realizes through the affair that they actually really want to stay in their primary relationship or the crisis of a person um, who um, realizes that um, this is... Uh, this is this, this revelation that has just happened um, was probably one of the most important things that happened in the relationship. You know, betrayal is not only a dirty word, it sometimes is the most powerful thing to shape up a rotten political system. <laughs> you know, and, but you don't know that in the moment, in the moment when you are in the day. So the crisis three months later, the crisis a year later, the opportunities that may be come from that. And even five years later, people may still say it was our worst crisis, but what came out of it was invaluable. I think it's one of three basically uh, different brain systems that evolved from mating and reproduction. Um, one is the sex drive craving for sexual gratification. Uh, W.H. Auden called it an intolerable neural itch. Um, uh, Pablo Neruda called it an infinite ache. Um, it can be associated with nobody at all. You can feel the sex drive when you're just driving along in your car or reading a book or seeing a movie. It's not necessarily focused on anybody. 
the second of these three brain systems, romantic love, is focused on one individual. Um, as George Bernard Shaw said, he said, love consists of overestimating the differences between one woman and another. And indeed, <laughs> that's exactly what we do. Um, and the third brain system is uh, feelings of deep, profound attachment to a human being. And it is my guess, and it's a guess, that these three brain systems operate in all kinds of ratios to create the feelings that we have uh, for one another. I think that the three brain systems evolve together. I think the sex drive evolved to get you out there looking for a whole range of partners. Uh, you can feel the sex drive for all kinds of people. I think romantic love evolved to enable you to focus your mating energy on just one at a time. And I think that third brain system, attachment, evolved to enable you to tolerate this human being at least long enough to raise a child together as a team. And of course, in the human animal, often for a lifetime. Um, you know, there's two parts of personality. There's, your, there's your, everything that comes out of your uh, childhood experiences, uh, uh, everything that comes out of um, uh, 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 your lifetime experiences, your environment, etc. And there's all those things that basically come out of your biology, out of your nature. And I'm just trying to add the second half of the puzzle. I'm not trying to denigrate in any way the environmental component. I'm just simply trying to say there's more than one aspect of personality. Scientists now clearly, uh, unquestionably believe that um, a good 50% of who you are does come out of your biology. And it's worth knowing when they walk into that office some of their natural predispositions. And I'm so particularly interested in the therapy community because it's a place that I feel that maybe this kind of research can really be of use. In other words, I, I was thinking in bed this morning, I was lying there thinking, gee, it's interesting how you're very, very, in a skilled way, dissecting the relationship uh, between the two people. But to what extent are you seeing that each one of them is coming, not only with their childhood experiences, but with certain biological predispositions to hear what you're saying in certain ways, to respond to that other individual in certain ways, to see themselves in certain ways, to look for certainly different kinds of things in a partnership. And in fact, in that book, Why Him, Why Her, the first half of the book, I really go into the biology of these four styles of thinking and behaving. And I thought that that would be the hard part of the book, and that the easy part of the book would then be, okay, an explorer marries a builder. That shouldn't be a problem. How's this going to work? And I found that was the hard part, because then I had to sit and think, okay, what's a, what's a relationship going to be like when one is restless and the other is cautious, when one wants the familiar and the other wants the unfamiliar? What's it, how are these relationships going to be? Anyway, so this is the brain. And as I talk about the brain here, I invite you to appreciate that the organ we're talking about is trying to figure out the organ we're talking about. And to bring this material that can be kind of intellectual or strange, somehow or remote, really down to an intimacy with ourselves in terms of moment-to-moment -moment experiencing and appreciating how that moment-to-moment -moment experiencing, absent a transcendental X factor called God, the divine, the ground, or what have you, absent that, moment-to-moment, -moment, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're hearing, what we're sensing, what we're seeing, and all the rest of that is being continually conditioned, constrained, and constructed by this odd three pounds of tofu inside the coconut. And when we bring it down to that level, it becomes much more intimate, much more experienced near. And by understanding some of the ways in which the movements of the meat, if you will, give rise to the movements of the mind, that can deepen our own intimacy with our own mind in terms of moment-to-moment -moment experiencing. And as you'll see, my thesis is that, and you'll see for yourself if you agree, that this growing understanding of the connecting between the dots of mental activity and the underlying dots of neural activity give us more and more opportunities to use mental activity very skillfully to actually change the brain, which then in turn changes the mind. Remember, you know, that, um, I mean, the really painful part of this whole thing is, uh, you know, the deception, right? And betrayal is, uh, betrayal is an awful experience. Uh, so the other thing that's recommended by both Andy Christensen and Don Balcom is that you set up some rules for talking about the affair at home. And, uh, and our, you know, our, um, 
uh, rules are they shouldn't talk about it at home. They should talk about it only in the session. And you know, that's frustrating for the, for the person who's been betrayed, or we call, the, call that person the hurt partner. And, uh, but <clears throat> it, it really allows you as a therapist to control uh, information that leads to excessive rumination and re-traumatizing this person. Uh, okay. And you know, the other thing in preliminaries is that you may, may need <clears throat> individual sessions with the, with the betrayer about the grief and losing the affair partner. And it's important to express empathy about that because even if they make a choice to commit, then um, you know, there is a loss. Um, and, you know, and, there's, you know, and everybody really thinks, well, you know, there's, there are a lot of setting conditions in the relationship that lead to the affair. So it's not really all the betrayer's fault, and yet it really is the betrayer's fault. There's been you know, a really immoral choice to go outside the relationship.